Enrich Cleaver, the famous American writer, said, you are either a part of the solution or you are going to be a part of the problem. Today, we are all aware of the biggest problem of our time, climate change. And as an architect, I realize that we have a central role in fixing this problem. So, who is an architect? An architect is an individual who design buildings and spaces. We design your homes. We design your cities. We design the very fabric of the society you live in. And over time, our designs have transformed our cities into planet-unfriendly spaces. Currently, almost 40% of the global carbon emission is being caused by the building and construction industry. 28% of this is being caused indirectly by the building services that we provide for your comfort, like the cooling and the heating systems. These systems run on electricity, which is generated in power plants, run on fossil fuels. Therefore, we become a part in polluting the global atmosphere. The remaining 11% is being caused indirectly by the building materials and construction. It is estimated that by the end of the year 2040, two-thirds of the global building stock will be buildings that are built today. And if they're not upgraded or improved accordingly, they will still be causing the emission of greenhouse gases. But this was the global perspective. Let's talk about local issues now. Take Lahore, for instance. Lahore, as we all know, is called the city of gardens. But not anymore. We all know that Lahore has been declared as one of the most polluted cities in the world in terms of air quality index. So, what went wrong? Let's take a step back in time. Before the so-called construction revolution, most of the houses in Lahore had a courtyard, or a sehen, or a veda, as we call it in Punjabi. There was a corridor around the courtyard, and all the rooms in the house opened into the corridor. The rooms had high ceilings with openable ventilators. This sort of plan made all the houses cross-ventilated and well-lighted. Thicker masonry walls, which were whitewashed, was another feature of these old homes. This resulted in hot air to rise up and move through the hatches, leaving the rooms comfortable throughout summers. In winters, the direct sunlight in the courtyard provided the much needed heat, making the rooms warm well into the evening. Thus, this sort of architectural planning made the houses comfortable and appropriate for the environment that we lived in. But the, this was our architectural legacy. But the design changed drastically towards the end of the 20th century. After a boom in the real estate sector, new privately owned housing schemes emerged and spread like mushrooms. House owners wanted their houses to be built on the new modified designs due to extensive travel and exposure to foreign architecture. And this changed the basic architectural plan of our house. The rise in the land value in recent years has placed 
an added pressure on architects to utilize every square inch for the ideal home. House owners want every conceivable facility in smallest of space. And to achieve that, nowadays, we provide thinner masonry walls, concrete slabs for roofs, lights, fans, false ceilings, air conditioning, and its toll is being felt on the environment. Lahore has never been so hot. The winters are now squeezed to just a couple of months. The weather has become intense. Our choices in architectural design and material is affecting the weather. We moved into the next millennium with this extra baggage of pomp and show, of people wanting to razzle-dazzle others with their wealth, and every space to be a selfie-worthy space. But at what cost? Architects are not just designers. We need to act as social scientists and planet activists and make our clients realize that each line that we sketch has a practical implication on the environment. So, what to do in this situation? How can architects shift the balance in favor of the climate? Well, this can be achieved very easily. Let's revisit the courtyard home again. It was a house that breathed. It inhaled and exhaled like its inhabitants. Our ancestors may not have known fancy words like passive design techniques, yet they were able to create spaces which were in complete sync with the environment. Let's learn from them. Let's learn from our past. Let's incorporate these passive design techniques into our buildings. In terms of material, instead of thicker masonry walls, we can give cavity walls. Air trapped inside these cavities can act as a natural insulating material. This technique can also be used for roofs. Roofs of existing buildings can also be insulated with the help of using mud pots, or they can be painted white. Providing roof gardens is another solution for both new and existing buildings. To counter heat, sun shades can also be provided in accordance with the sun orientation. Sun orientation should be kept in mind while planning and designing new housing schemes and buildings. Architects should convince their clients to use indigenous and locally available materials to minimize the carbon footprint of the buildings. And lastly, we must look into policy making. All stakeholders, including political leaders, government officials, experts, activists, and academics, should sit together to come up with solutions which address the building and construction problems. In the end, I would like all of you to have a moment of introspect. Our dwellings are not homes. They're merely boxes wrapped in gaudy wrapping papers filled with lavish ornaments. Let's make our houses homes again. Let's learn from our heritage. Let's learn from that wisdom and incorporate it in our modern design solutions. Because ultimately, if I may borrow words from the famous architect Julia Brown, my buildings will be my legacy. They will speak for me long after I'm gone. Thank you.